Rising Stars of SaaS is brought to you by Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of software that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever. And right now, Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. Chart hop. Growing your company is hard. Planning for it doesn't have to be. Visualize your company's future in seconds with Chart Hop. Request a demo at charthop.com slash twist. And Pipe. SaaS companies, this is for you. Pipe helps you unlock your recurring revenue as upfront capital. No debt, no loans, no dilution. Sign up in minutes and start trading on Pipe free for 12 months at pipe.com slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and I've been your host for over a thousand episodes that you can go watch at thisweekinstartups.com. And we like to do a little series here uh, on the show, and one of them uh, that we did was the Rising Stars of SaaS. SaaS is software as a service, but as we are prone to do when we do these kind of little mini series, if you will, is to maybe open up the aperture uh, and allow you to think about SaaS in a different way. Uh, And one of those ways is to think about software as a service as hardware as a service. Um, And our next guest is doing something really fascinating in robotics. The worst job you could ever have, I believe, in the modern society Having done this job in the 80s at my dad's bar and my my baby brother, Josh, uh, loved this job. I hated it. I was front of the house. I was a busboy and a waiter. My older brother, Jamie, was a bartender and a waiter. But my baby brother loved to be a dishwasher. Nobody I've ever met since has enjoyed being a dishwasher. It is the worst job in the world. Now, I know there are many precious snowflakes listening, socialists, all who believe that we have to be really careful, really careful that we don't lose jobs. Oh no, what if we lose jobs? Newsflash, the human spirit and society has so many problems to solve that getting rid of brutal, hard, manual labor is a good thing. We shouldn't try to protect protect backbreaking labor. We should try to automate it and move on. If you have any demented, strange feelings about this, you're probably just a young person or a socialist maniac who has not figured out that when we got rid of telephone operators, those people got jobs. When we got rid of uh, uh, bank tellers giving you money, when we got rid of people literally dragging plows and replace them with horses and then replace them with uh you know the the in, in uh ice engine life got better for many people so getting rid of dishwashers literally eliminating that job i believe my personal belief would be a noble thing to do just like cleaning bathrooms if somebody could come up with a way to automatically clean bathrooms it'd be great if a human never had to do that again My guest today is the CEO and founder of a company called Dishcraft Robotics, and she has been working on this issue. She may not have the same feelings I do strongly about eliminating backbreaking manual labor to let people do other jobs that we need, Uh, but welcome to the program, Linda Puglio. Did I get it right, Puglio? You got it right. Oh, thank the Lord. Okay, you heard my rambling anti-socialist communist craziness because every time I talk about automation, because I'm such a rabid capitalist on Twitter, the the echo chamber that nobody should pay attention to, I get absolutely demolished because the socialist and Bernie bros have found me and they attack me. How dare you want to have self-driving cars and all this stuff? How do you feel about it? You're working on... And we're going to get into all the details, but this is the number one issue that comes up in your life is, oh my God, you're going to eliminate this job. And there's this many millions of people who are dishwashers. How do you feel? Do you feel like more like I feel that we should eliminate these jobs and move on to higher level things and there'll always be other jobs? Or do you feel like there's a zero sum game here? We're going to eliminate all the jobs and nobody's going to have anything to do. 
Oh, we think that there is really great, wonderful, creative things to do in the kitchen, like cooking the food. And so we think that <laughs> that's where people should be working because then that creates a better guest experience. And the reason why Dishcraft started was because so many people came to us from the restaurant industry and said, we can't hire for this role. And when we do have a dishwasher, they churn out within 30 days and it takes us forever to find a replacement. So please, can you automate it for us? So literally, nobody wants this job. And getting rid of it, <laughs> with the exception of my brother, who I think he just liked hanging out with the crazy cooks who were insane. He just liked being part of that culture. Like, it is an onboarding, but you could also be a prep chef. That was the other way to kind of get into the kitchen. I was told from a friend of mine who was trying to run a restaurant in San Francisco proper that the going rate per hour for a dishwasher because I think they were unionized, but was 30 or $35 an hour. Is that correct? In San Francisco, in a union property, correct. $35 an hour to clean dishes in San Francisco. Well, how does a restaurant even survive if, and these are typically 10-hour shifts, 12-hour shifts? Correct. So back of the envelope here, am I correct in saying that dishwashers in San Francisco were making six figures if they were unionized? It's It costs the restaurant $90,000 if it's a union <gasps> location. That's wow. not what the that's not what the dishwasher makes though because there's fees and what Got it. So it has become such a it's it's become the hardest position to fill in a restaurant, is that a fair thing to say? Correct. Kind of maybe always has been. Um, so you as an entrepreneur saw this at some point, did, was there a moment of inspiration or did you just come from robotics and say, what's the next best thing? What's the best timing for putting robots in the restaurant or did, were you open-minded? Tell me how you came to the idea. Yeah, I actually wasn't looking at restaurants at all. I was, <laughs> I was so burned out from my previous startup that I was looking at, you know, large companies like Google and Facebook and folks from the restaurant industry reached out to me and said, look, we know that you've done this other robotic cleaning company and we're really trying to solve this one problem. And can you point us in the right direction? A, can it be solved? And then B, who can solve it? And because I was in between gigs, I just and I was always fascinated by the food world. I just called up restaurants that I liked and I said, hey, can I work in your kitchen for a few days? And then I started to do research and realized no one was tackling this one product and it could be done, it could be automated. And that was a golden opportunity. And so I just started pulling together a team. And previously you had done, I believe, a, a robot vacuum, but more of a commercial grade one. Is that right? Or was yeah, it more it of was, a... Well, it was a consumer grade one. So it was, oh, it was Nito Robotics. Yeah. And it was at one point, it was the number two competitor to iRobot Roomba. Yeah, and you learned a lot from that about the limitations and the possibilities, I think, of, of what's possible with robots. Why why did the Roomba and Nito and, and, and that class become, and am I correct that they became the first mass robot for, for, for consumers? Yes. Why did that become the first thing? Why is that use case so doable because people would not be buying these and i i know people who have them they won't shut up about them the, these ro you know cleaning robots so is it some combination of people hate vacuuming or they're the technology is just really good at this task what what is it why did that become the first one you wouldn't expect that i don't think I yeah, it's interesting because it. when I started the company, what we really wanted to do was bathroom cleaning and specifically shower cleaning, because if you ask consumers, that is one thing that they just would love help with. But mm. from a technical standpoint, it was much easier to design something that would go along a floor and clean than to solve right out the gate the vertical challenge. Because of gravity. Right. We don't have levitation boots or anything like that yet so the enabling technology of keeping something on the ground is easier has there been another mass uh, market robot that uh you know like the roomba or the nito like the vacuum sort of segment and if not why and what do you think has the next chance sure i think it's 
pretty difficult for robotics right now to do multifunctions. And so vacuum cleaning was very nicely designed to just do one thing and do it really well. Dishcraft, similarly, we are working on one task and can excel at that one task. And you start to see proliferation in robotics of these kind of uh, attempts where you take one thing, it's very repetitive, it's very manual, and you automate it. And I think that the dream, of course, is to, you know, have a consumer product that can, you know, clean your entire household. We're just not there yet. It's a very difficult technical challenge. All right. So when we get back, I want to know how does one even start to create a robot to clean dishes and model? Obviously, you worked in these restaurants. So I want to I want you to unpack that story of working there and then how your brain works to say, what how do we construct this process when we get back on the speed of startups? Listen, I have invested in over 200 startups. I've advised even more. I've been in the startup game forever. And one of the key things you want to do in a startup is you want to minimize your burn. And you need to maximize efficiency because startups are always under-resourced versus larger competitors, right? So I look for people who can take a nickel and turn it into a dollar of value. Well, how do you do that? Well, look at all the different software products you're spending money on and how much time and energy your team has to put into integrating them all together. If you look at those two things, you're going to say we're spending too much money and it's too much integration time. Well, Odoo is here to change that. O-D-O-O. I want you to go there now and get $1,000 in credit. I mean, I'm not joking. $1,000 in credits. It's becoming a little bit of a, a competition here on the show of who could be the most generous. Odoo.com slash twist, and you will get $1,000 in credits for their fully customizable and fully integrated suite of software products that let you build and scale your stack as you scale your business. It's simple, it's modular, so you use what you need and all of their apps integrate perfectly together with each other. Plus it's all open source. You can spend your time on talent instead of expensive software. You need to spend that money building a team. So go ahead and get $1,000 from Odoo at odoo.com slash twist right now. All right, welcome back to this week in startup. So Linda, you were telling me about, you're thinking about your next startup, vacuum robots for consumers, they work, they're cheap, they get the job done, they don't need to levitate. But dishes, when I heard you were doing this, that to me seemed like, wait a second, we have dishwashers, but you know, they're kind of rigid and emptying and filling the dishwasher is so brutal that that is the first task we give to any child as a chore. One person's got to load the dishwasher, other one's got to unload it. When you when you went into those restaurants and you asked your friends to go work in them, what what was going through your mind as you were conceiving this as a product? And then what is the product of Dishcraft and how does it work? Sure. So, you know, I believe you have to do the job yourself to really understand it. And so we just started to look at how how do dishes get processed? How do the dirty dishes come in? How do they go through a traditional dish machine? How do they come out and then go back into service? And we broke that down into a number of steps. And, you know, and then it first rights for everyone at Dishcraft is actually washing dishes themselves. And so we then broke into all this different steps and said, okay, let's let's do each part on its own and then stitch it together. Because again, with robotics, as long as you can simplify it, it just makes everything much, much easier. So what we do is we, dishes come in, they go into a collection system that is nice and tidy and clean and saves a commercial food uh, service place space. Those dishes are really going into carts. We take those carts and bring them over to the robot and it almost acts as a cartridge and when you push the cart in, then the robot takes over from there. It picks up every single item. It recognizes, is this a bowl or is it a plate? Is there something on it that could harm me? And then it goes through, does a pre-rinse cycle, and then it inspects it for cleanliness. If it's past inspection, it racks it, pushes that rack into a traditional dish machine. And then on the other side, we now have a robot that will pick it out of the rack and put it into clean carts. 
So I'm imagining a cafeteria-like experience in some cases where I bust my dish, you know, at the Stanford cafeteria or whatever cafeteria. I put it on that conveyor belt at Google's cafeteria and it goes there. Or is this for a restaurant where the busboy or the waiter, I guess busboy is, yeah. What do you call, what do you call, what's the non-gender busser. version of a busser? It's is a busser. that really it? They call okay, him a steward yeah. or a busser. A so buster. we are only meant for high volume places like a uh, Google cafeteria or a hotel. And instead of having that big rotating round of trays that you probably saw when you, you know, were at a yep. college campus, instead you're putting your dish into our collection system. Got it. Then all of those get rolled onto a truck, sent to a central warehouse where big robots, you plug them in like a cartridge and they get taken apart, basically perfectly cleaned and then shelved back into the same or other clean carts, I would guess, and then into shipped clean back carts. into clean carts. You gotta clean the cart too, right? It's a cartridge Yeah, we, we put that through a, sa a traditional sanitizer. And so the idea is don't even, like linens, I remember when I was in the restaurant business, you, yeah, restaurants didn't have washers and dryers, they just got linens dropped off. Why have the washer or dryer take up space? Why have to maintain a washer and dryer and soap and everything? Like no restaurants do that, but restaurants do clean dishes. So when you go to a restaurant, I'm assuming a mid-sized or small restaurant, this isn't the solution for them yet. It's the it's the cha it's the big chains or the cafeterias that want this. Correct. Initially, yeah. this was designed for large scale cafeterias because there was a lot of consistency there. And long term vision, of course, we would like to help restaurants as well. We are starting a pilot in December with a restaurant in Palo Alto. Mm. Um, but our main focus is offices, hospitals, hotels. Got it. And, and I wonder, I mean, COVID has an impact 20 different ways on this business. The, uh, the obvious headwind is people not going to restaurants, starting to change, people not going to Google Cafe, people not going to work, working from home. Putting that aside, we'll we'll have a, uh, a we have two vaccines that look like they're going to be incredibly promising at the time we're recording this. But the tailwind, I would think, is uh, I don't think a lot of dishwashers are going to be as consistent as a robot, the robot is going to know if it actually got that really hard stain off. Or are there sensors that would actually know if there was bacteria present or temperature controls? Because I'm sure regular dishwashers have those. They get inspected on some regular basis. So talk to me about that and the, and the sort of the cleanliness standard that you can achieve that maybe can't be achieved manual, certainly manually, and in a hybrid system where somebody's manually putting them into a dish, uh, uh, you know, a dishwasher. Yeah. So we actually work on either side of the traditional sanitizer or dish machine. And that's what's taking care of the bacteria. But we do do inspection on both sides of it. So we can guarantee a level of cleanliness that no traditional dish room can. The Each wear gets inspected 22 different times in different angles. And mm. a human just doesn't have that kind of time to be able to do that level or certainly to be able to do it consistently across a 10 hour shift. And so that's really the beauty of robotics there because you can get great safety, great cleanliness, you reduce slips, falls, trips, you are naturally socially distanced and you can do it at a throughput that just isn't normally achieved with a traditional room. And you have to use your own type of plates. Like it's, we're not talking about this is Tesla or Waymo building self-driving cars where they have to be released onto city streets, back roads. If you're, you know, on some back road in Half Moon Bay or something in Mulholland Drive, I mean, it, it, Teslas are going to have really hard times with those kind of edge cases. Here, you eliminate the edge cases because you, design the plates. This isn't for any plate style or pots and pans yet, correct? Correct. So we have a set of wares, different size bowls, different size plates. We also are now doing mugs and flatware and will be doing glassware. Uh, we work with major ware manufacturers, but they have customized the plates to work with our system. And we do that because when you are operating like a linen service, uh, having consistency across a whole bunch of places just makes everything much more efficient. And it also helps the robots be much more, uh, have a much higher throughput. 
they can go faster. Speed is part of this equation because I would assume the quicker you can turn around plates, the cheaper you can charge people per plate per use. And is that the model here, per plate per use? We charge per meal. And so a variety of items are included in that meal. And um, we- Buck a meal or something? Yeah, yeah, basically. And then we know what volume that location does per day. And so you just get a monthly charge, assuming that volume. All right, when we get back from this quick break, I wanna know it, when you sell this to a campus, are they doing this because they want to save money or they just want to eliminate the headache? And if they are saving money, what is the cost savings today when we get back on This Week in Startups? Before you grow your company, you need to know your company. Chart Hop is an organizational management platform that helps you focus on the most important asset in your company. It's your people. Of course, it's your people. You know this. Chart Hop's seamless integration lets you collect, organize, and analyze all of your people data in one simple platform. You can build agile, adaptable, and inclusive teams, automatically create and update organizational charts, which a lot of founders, they don't even think of doing this. I don't know why. It, it creates confusion inside their own organizations. It also lets you centralize your people data with seamless integrations, no spreadsheets needed. You're not pulling data from seven different sources and putting it into some Google sheet. You can just plan for everything and scale your company with transparency and intention. Chart Hop allows you to visually build out your team. You can look at this video I'm playing right now, and you'll spend more time on strategy and less time moving around boxes in PowerPoint. Chart Hop also allows you to create compelling visualizations of all your people data, from diversity metrics to compensation to performance reviews, all directly in the organizational chart. This is a new way to think about your company, right? So you're not just building something that gets out of date quickly. This is a living document. And sign up to access Chart Hop and you will get your first five employees free. That's right. It's a $600 value by going to charthop.com slash twist. C-H-A-R-T-H-O-P.com slash twist. Charthop.com slash twist to build your dream team today. Welcome back to This Week in Startup. Linda Puglio is with us uh, and she is the Robo Linda on Twitter. The R-O-B-O Linda. You've been obsessed with robots for a while. You seem like you are. I'll Since totally I moved honest. to Silicon Valley. Yeah, I really? mean, I love it. I just, I, I fell into the field and it's just fascinating and I love it. When did you first uh, fall into the robot field, as it were? When did you first see a robot? Were you, did you go to MIT or something? Or were you watching Star Trek? What, what was the first exposure when you knew you were the Robo Linda? No, I am the most unlikely candidate for it. Okay. I moved to Silicon Valley in 2004 and one of my neighbors was at Stanford and had a hardware background. And he just said to me, hey, I'm going to build a robot company. I had a Roomba and was not that thrilled with it. Mm -hmm. And so we just started batting around ideas and saying, like, could you make a better floor cleaning robot? And so I did not know anything about hardware, but I knew how to get things made in China from previous history. And so that's how that's how I started and haven't left. So when we went to break, I was curious business model wise, why are cafeterias, I know that you've got customers, you've had customers for a couple of years now, I think two years of customers, how long have you had About the product to market? About a year. So in that first year, obviously people are experimenting, that's a good opportunity to land and expand and right, that's what SaaS companies do or has companies hardware as a service, you're kind of another category, we have to come up with another acronym for you. RAS, <laughs> robots as a service. RAS, it's not bad, does that actually exist as a term? We I think just so. made it up? RAS? Yeah, no, we, we, I mean, within, within robotic companies, that's how we, we talk about it. You do it. call it RAS? Okay, good, yeah. it's the first time hearing of it. I have, I have, truth be told, two other RAS companies, Cafe X, which is, you know, doing coffee machines, and they recently uh, are now selling the machine to other people now that it works and they got it all working. So they're taking a kind of similar approach to you, like, you know, hey, let's sell it to a Google campus or let's sell it to, you know, a coffee company that wants to have an extra five locations per airport. Um and then Root AI, which is using AI really interestingly to pick raspberries, which is another one of these use cases that's really hard, um, but but kind of ready, right? Like the certain things that are kind of flipping. So for the people who are experimenting, I'm curious, are they looking to save money ultimately? 
uh, have cleaner dishes or just eliminate having the pain and suffering of this high turnover job that nobody wants to do? Customers will come to us for a couple of reasons. One set would, of course, everyone would love to save money. Another has so much trouble filling the role itself that they just want it to outsource. And then there's a whole other set that really comes to us for sustainability reasons. So often there's a location that is serving on single use disposables and doesn't want to. They would prefer to do reusables, but they don't have room to have a dish room. And so they will choose us and it gives them, you know, often a cost savings from compostables, but then they are able to have like an elevated experience and serve on ceramic ware. That's fascinating. Now, sometimes we get into this uh, philosophical debate, and I, I find it's typically non-scientists or people not actually doing the work who have this debate. Like people are like, well, Teslas, you know, the batteries are terrible for the environment and nobody knows what to do with them. And they're kind of like nuclear waste. And nuclear is terrible because we don't know what to do with the nuclear rods. And it's like, I, I think we've actually, when I talk to scientists or I talk to Elon, they kind of say that like, that's not an actual issue. That's like fake news. I, when I've heard this story of using a dishwasher or hand washing, or I'm sorry, or using disposable, I hear this religious debate. It's some people, <laughs> some people start to sound like Trump. <laughs> some people are saying paper is better uh, because it grows and trees grow and it, and Actually, the, the soap and the washing and the energy used in dishwashing is bad for the planet. There's so many factors that come into this, but give us a sense of how you would argue this. And is there any merit when somebody says disposable stuff is better because you're not using liquid soap and water? A third party has done, and I'm not allowed to release the name yet, but unfortunately, but has done a study on us and said that uh, by far, ours is better. Like a one of our customers had the study done and it paid itself back within only five uses. But a ceramic plate can be washed thousands of times. I mean, I mean, some of these ceramic plates, <laughs> I know from being a product of like the public school system in Brooklyn, like I think they were, I was using them in the 80s. They were coming from the 70s or 60s. Like they, they have a decade long use. What's, what's the use cycle on a duty cycle on one of those? Several years. I mean, it, it just depends on it's definitely several years. Several and, years. you know, we hundreds can wash, of uses. Yes, definitely. Like at least 300, but we are not far enough along, but we believe thousands. Right. And now that you're working on it, I would guess the robot could learn how to clean them and not destroy them, which is what typically happens with a human they're going to just throw the dishes and break them more often or chip them etc um but what about water usage because i have seen now when i was just looking at dishwashers as it as it, as one does every couple of years and um you know we have energy consumption we think about for refrigerators what's the state of the water usage is water a major issue or not because that's another sustainability issue is how much water this uses and the, and the soaps and that kind of stuff because it seems to me it's getting more efficient and computer vision would know this plate and i don't know if you're up to this point in the company um at dishcraft um which is dishcraft.com good domain name like, does the robot know this is a particularly dirty dish? Keep going. This one's clean. We can move it on or, or are we not there yet? Yeah. So on the first part, which is water usage, we only use cold recirculated water, which is way less because we are able to enclose it versus in a traditional dish room, you always need to use potable water. And so there's a lot more waste there. Ah. So we're definitely better on the water side and power consumption because we don't have to heat the water. The first part I get is like the water usage. So that's cold. Oh, the smartness. Sure. And, and the smartness where like computer vision would be like, still dirty. Like this one was used for a salad. Somebody had mac and cheese on this one. It's going to take a little bit longer to clean it. Exactly. So we're bringing, we're collecting tons and tons of data. And so the robot gets smarter all the time. The idea is we have learned... Uh, what things are much harder for us to clean than others. And so long term, we would like to be able to tweak that up and down to have faster throughput with very light things. Like if you're if you're just doing salad or 
a sandwich that's pretty easy to clean. When it's macaroni and cheese, it's it's much tougher. If it's baked on, you need to run it through extra cycles. And so we are um, we are playing around with that right now. What do when I was uh, going through the Cafe X experience, the Root AI experience, a density, a hardware as a service company as opposed to a RAS company, but similar, you really had. I mean, it was like running four startups. One, you have robotics hardware. Two, you have software. Three, you would be having to give people a cup of coffee. And then in the, in the Cafe X, you'd have real estate. You'd have to have a location. In your case, you you have to have a, a software, a hardware. You've also got to do logistics and deliver these things to people. It's incredibly a hard amount of work. How do you raise money for a company like this? Because you're not building a photo sharing app or a marketplace, you know, things that maybe don't take as much, uh, you know, complexity. But how do you how do you convince investors about this? How did you get investors to to get on board for this? Because let's face it, there, there haven't been many big successes, except for the iRobot and Roomba, right? Sure. So I did have or credibility am I right because on that? I don't know if I'm right. <laughs> there's not there aren't there aren't a plethora of examples of companies that have exited a billion plus in robotics yet. <laughs> I had definitely credibility be from Nito Robotics because that uh, that was that company was acquired at a at a nice multiple. I was able to show that no one was tackling this problem yet and it was a very large market. About half of the investors I know have actually, in one way or other, had their first job in a restaurant industry. And mm. so they immediately had sympathy for the problem that we were solving. And so untapped market, belief that I could put together the team, belief that we could build something defensible. I mean, it was a pretty good recipe. Uh, and you've raised around $45 million to date. Uh, what is it going to take for this to become standard? Because you also like an Uber or a DoorDash, I would assume you're going to be doing a city or even town-based rollout. And are, am I right that you're starting here in, in the, the uh, cradle of technology, the, the Bay Area? Correct. So we started here and we're making plans for other geographies for 2021 and beyond. And so the idea was to have partners that already had in m many cases, distribution across the US and so that it was a land and expand account the same way that you had phrased earlier, that start small, but you can grow. And COVID has actually frankly done us a favor because we were able to get into a lot of accounts when they're not at full occupancy right now. And so it's a way to partner and then grow with them. Ah, right, because the restaurants are now at 25% capacity or 50% by law. If it was, if I'm a packed restaurant and you're going for the big packed places, you know, doing this is risk, right? And, and, it's, and it's change. And so that is always really challenging. Uh, when we get back, I want to know, when will the robots be on location? Um, or is that just way too complex of a problem? When we get back on This Week in Startups. SaaS companies with reoccurring revenue used to only have two ways, basically, to grow. You could sell your equity, shares in your company, or you could go into debt. And now there is a third way to grow without debt, without dilution, and that's Pipe. Pipe is a two-sided marketplace that connects SaaS companies, people who have reoccurring revenue, with institutional investors who bid to purchase these revenues for their annual value up front. It's like the NASDAQ, but for software contracts. This is a totally new category. It's never really existed before, and Pipe is leading it. Pipe believes they are the smarter way to grow your business, and with Pipe, there is no debt, no loans, and no dilution. And I literally had one of the founders of a company I'm on the board of say, hey, by the way, we're getting an advance of hundreds of thousands of dollars. We just sold our yearly revenue on pipe.com and they said, what do you think? And I was like, great. <laughs> they happen to be a sponsor of our podcast as well. I was like, oh, that's where I heard about it. I was like, okay, great. Pipe is so confident. You'll love trading your SaaS subscription that if you sign up at pipe.com slash twist, pipe, P-I-P-E dot com slash twist, they'll eliminate 
all your trading fees for one full year. So you could save tens of thousands of dollars depending on the size of your business and the volume you trade. And it's your choice. You can get these bids and not do it. You could wait to get a better bid. That's kind of the market setting the price and the value of your reoccurring revenue. So happy piping. Sign up today at pipe.com slash twist. Let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, everybody, welcome back. It's the rising stars of SAS or RAS or HASS, whatever you prefer. Robots as a service today, and uh, this may be a trend. Uh, many folks are looking at robotics and saying, hey, well, how can this uh, get rid of some of the most painful, arduous, hard to fill jobs in the world? Um, was there some technology moment that made robotics, you know, like the smartphone has made made the drone movement possible, right? Because accelerometers got made en masse, batteries got better. Is there something that's been driving robotics in a similar fashion? Because it does yeah, seem it, to be it, making a lot of gains. Yeah, uh, sensor technology became really, really cheap. And mostly because iPhones, the proliferation of, of phones made camera technology much cheaper. So it's the camera, the camera is the key piece. But what about the arms? Because I know those arms used to be in, you know, millions of dollars, then hundreds of thousands of dollars. My and understanding then tens is of thousands. Now, and now, I mean, there's a bunch of startups that can do it for very low cost. So yeah, $5, like hardware, 10, hardware in general has come down all, quite a lot. The, the arms... Did you guys just call them in the industry arms or are they called something more like technical? No, they're called arms. <laughs> they're called arms. Okay. So what we all envision as a robotic arm, those I know for the from the cafe experience had gotten, you know, from 50 down to 20 down to 10. And we're literally moving a 12 ounce cup of coffee around with an arm that's rated to be able to pick up hundreds of pounds. These things are going to get to what level? $500, $1,000 at scale? I mean, yeah, are they still plummeting in costs? I, certainly, I think you could do it for a thousand dollars. Yeah, and what what happens in the world when these things, you know, is there some next piece to that that needs to get better? The moving of the arm, or are these arms starting to hit proficiency that's able to solve most tasks, and we're just up to software and computer vision and the programming of the arm? If does that my question make, make sense? Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a good question. It's a combination. I think the grasping technology to do multi different textures and shapes and sizes and weights is not quite there yet. Um, and uh, the vision that's is another piece of it. So the grasping technology, whether it's, you know, you may be picking up a fork, which might be very, or a piece of China for a cup of coffee, that might be very delicate. But if you start putting frying pans in there that weigh four pounds that are heavy, it, you, you're going to need a different type of, maybe the arm's the same, but the little connector on the end? Yeah, it's the fingers. It's like, like these hands are really amazing, and robotic hands are not quite as, as flexible as our human hands. Yeah, you need kind of the Luke Skywalker hand. The, 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 the mobility of a Darth Vader hand that's being chopped off, the Luke Skywalker hand that's been chopped off, you know, but that sort of, we have this sensitivity where we could pick up a kettlebell that weighs 30 pounds, or we can pick up a flower and not crush it. I mean, it is pretty extraordinary. If you, if compared to the human hand, what percentage of the way are we there? Well, I think it's a, the problem. We do have that technology. It's just having that done at a price point that is able to expand. That would be that thousand dollar arm that I've mentioned, having the manipulator on the end of it right now just can't be done under a thousand dollars. So the manipulator exists, but that manipulator is really expensive to be able to be a, mu a multi-function manipulator fingers type thing. It's really fascinating. We got the arm down. We just got to get the fingers done. But later in our lifetime, I guess in 10 or 20 years, we're going to have really good fingers, I guess, to do this kind of dexterity. Yeah, so Dishcraft, the funny thing is we, we really looked, uh, spent a lot of time on that. And that's why we ended up with having our own dishes because there's a very thin stainless steel on the back that lets us use magnets so you don't need the fingers at all. See, this is what I was getting at. It's like, I think one of the th the interesting parts of these problems, and again, uh, Cafe X and Density, which does people counting, one, until you roll up your sleeves and put this technology in the real world, you can't have those magnificent moments where you're like, wait a second, if we just put a magnet in the plate, we don't need fingers, we need a magnet. And it's automatically going to center it because the magnet's in the center, right? I mean, I'm guessing you can just, boom, pinpoint the magnet where you want it to get picked, and it doesn't have to be perfect. 
Exactly. The magnet makes it perfect. Oh, it's so smart. The cup at Cafe X had gotten so... Uh, they had done so well in terms of the dexterity of it, because the spilling obviously was a big thing, that they started filling the foam to give iced lattes like the the, the mountaintop. I'm making like a little curving with my hand for, for, for listeners uh, who are not watching on YouTube. And then they got so uh, confident that when they would make a latte, the robot arm would do a quick little swirl before they put it into the bay for you. And you'd watch the coffee do like a little swirl and a, you know, like a barista was going to do. And obviously la latte art and everything's coming next and super easy to do uh, as these uh, robots do that. Um, so the other question, when does the, when do the robots eventually go to the restaurant and, and, and do it there? Or is that just not efficient? Like the linen situation is not efficient. I think that there is a, certain percentage of the market where it makes sense to have robots on site if their volume is great enough. There is also a certain percentage where they're so small, it would just never make sense at a cost to have one on site. Because if you think about, if you think about a lot of restaurants, they're only open a certain period of the day, you know, and a robot could work 24 hours and so you'll always gain a, and we can have one person who can oversee, say, four to six robots. You're just never going to be able to get the labor advantages on site at a price point for certain small locations. I do think that there, in the future, we have dreams of packaging this up really small uh, at volume where it's less expensive and more flexible. Uh, but right now, what we have, it works fantastic in this specific model. It would seem to me if you were doing thousands of people a day at a stadium or, you know, a college or a campus, uh, you know, a, a corporate campus, no brainer to move the robots on site. Like you're saying, you, you know, you're, you, you get the value of running them 24 hours a day. But when they run for three hours a day, that's kind of like, yeah, it's just an obscene yeah, amount I mean, of technology to not use it for 24 hours a day. The idea is if even at a college campus, instead of having one dish room per dining area, you can have one centralized hub and get all the efficiencies of, say, in the equivalent, a commissary kitchen by just having one hub on the campus and you shorten the logistics time instead of having 10 different small dish rooms. Uh, knowing what you know about robotics, here's the question I like to ask smart people. It's just like really... Always very interesting, um, the answers I get for this one. Which will come first? A self-driving car that can drive from San Francisco to, uh, you know, let's say, uh, you know, uh, SFO. So from Union Square to SFO, a self-driving car that can do that route. Or a VTOL that can take off from the Embarcadero and land at SFO. Uh, electric vertical takeoff and landing <laughs> which one's going to come first for commercials use no driver i'm talking level four f level five fully au automated no steering wheel not you know you can driver can take over which one you think is going to come first and why it's so interesting that question i look i'm not that smart i neither I am i i'm I asking think, you <laughs> you're smarter than me <laughs> i think more work for longer has actually been done on you know, the driving versus, you know, flying down. But there's, you know, like I, I'm actually an advisor to one of those companies. So, you know, my guess- The, the takeoff and landing and fee toll company? Yeah. Yeah, the, th those companies are fascinating. I think regulation is gonna be such that cities with water, Sydney, the Bay Area, it's, it's in the name, the Bay Area, uh, you know, Manhattan to Brooklyn, whatever route, Staten Island to Manhattan. I think because these VTOLs will fly over water, they have less of a chance of doing harm. Uh, and therefore, the impact, you know, of an accident will be a veto will fall out of the sky, God forbid, lose two propellers and land in the Hudson. Right. And they'll just get picked up by the Coast Guard. and They'll be fine because it's only flying 200 feet above the water and it'll still be able to do a controlled descent. It won't be like, I don't know if you know the history of Manhattan, but there was the Pan Am accident where they used to fly, 
I think they're called Chinooks, you know, the double bladed helicopters used to fly. And when I was a kid, and I think it was in 75 or something, one of them fell over on the Pan Am building. And that was the end of helicopter flights over Manhattan. But you used to go to the Pan Am building above Grand Central and fly a Chinook helicopter to your flight to Pan Am to go to Los Angeles or to London. I mean, and we haven't had it since just because of that one accident. And you know what the accident was caused by? It turns out one of the struts was just malfunctioned and the helicopter tipped over. It wasn't a pilot's fault, wasn't weather, nothing wrong other than a bolt was loose. It's so crazy that the whole system was thrown away. You couldn't fly helicopters anymore over Manhattan. Yeah, often, I mean, often it's something like a bird that just, you know, flies the wrong way. And, you know, my Edge husband case. used to be working for NEO quite a while ago, uh, which is an autonomous vehicle company. And he said, you know, the problem is there'll be, some piece of paper that flies through the air and, you know, the vision system just doesn't know how to decipher what this is and how to handle it and where to go around it. Yeah. So now you've, you've got literally a car going 70 miles an hour swerving around a paper, a brown paper bag, thinking it's a motorcycle or slamming on the brakes and causing a five car pileup. Like people really don't understand how hard this technology is. I think they're just Everybody was, five years ago, everybody was telling me we'd have self-driving cars now. I asked them now when we're going to have self-driving cars. They all say in 15 years. I don't know what, I mean, the est it's really hard to make estimates, but you're telling me cleaning plates and dishes, no problem. We got this. The this way is, we do it, because we have simplified the, the problem so much that we've enclosed it and condensed it down so that it's a very known problem. Our, the next steps for Dishcraft is not, the technology part is definitely solved. Now it's just expansion. Yeah, getting people to adopt the technology. I guess some people might want China or like maybe certain types of plates. They want fancier plates. Then maybe, yeah, so are there certain, any roadblocks? Yeah. Yeah, there's a certain part of the market where we're just not a good fit for, like fine dining that has a hundred different little tiny dishes. Yeah. But there's this other great part where there's a lot of consistency and it's simple and we can handle that. You know what's going to be nice too is I, I suspect because you're going to standardize, you could do fun things like put logos on them or have different colors or have holiday skews. So if people wanted to have like, you know, if I'm running my restaurant and I'm a ramen restaurant or I decide to add ramen to the menu, you have a ramen bowl already because you've somebody else wanted it. So now you got a magnetic ramen bowl and I can say, give me a hundred a week. I want to try ramen for a week and just see if that works. Like you can just add a SKU and I can just add it to my order, my website or, or, or my portal. We have we have visions and we are not working with Disney today, but we joke about the Mickey Mouse shaped ear plates that we could supply <laughs> someday. I mean, it's it reminds me of, you know, when you go through the TSA security, they, they turn those luggage racks. Remember we used to go to airports and we would travel. <laughs> They turned those bins into advertising and it was really effective advertising for a while. I remember Uber was using it in the early days. You'd be like, what's Uber? And it'd be like, you can get a cab right now on your phone. You know, you're going through security, uh, download the app. Uh, all right, listen, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're hiring. Uh, so if you, uh, who, who are you hiring for uh, right now? Uh, Great. So we would love a software need? engineer, an AI engineer and a head of marketing. AI, oh, head of marketing too. Ah, very cool. The branding part. Yeah, see, I think the branding, I like the branding challenge of your business as well because dishcraft, like wish, witchcraft is so much fun. Like, ooh, and I think get, you know, the, whoever the CMO of this company is, is going to be able to have a cool impact because they could do some really fun stuff like around marketing or unique branding around the, the dishware that makes you know that it's this type of dishware. And in other countries, I believe there's some standardization of bento boxes. And then in Korea, they have the stackable to-go tins. I don't know what they're called, but they put jajamyeong in them, like this certain type of noodles that everybody eats in Korea. And they're I'm, I'm making a like a almost like a circular cake pan, and they stack mm -hmm. and you can carry them. Do you know what I'm talking like the about? Tiffins? You tiffin? Chi but that's tiffin? in India. Yeah. yeah, but it is like that. There, I mean, there was a movie about that where people were carrying them around and they would drop off everybody's lunch and then- I love that movie. I don't remember what it's What's called, the name of that movie? We're gonna drive ourselves it. crazy. But wait, you know the name of it. Tiffin? T-I? F-F-I-N. Tiffins. Uh, food, India. Movie. 
Was it Slumdog Millionaire? No. The Lunchbox. No, there's another one. The Lunchbox? The Lunchbox. I think it's, that's it. It's the Lunchbox. A 20... What are the chances that you and I have both seen the romance film, The Lunchbox? Uh, that is hilarious. So for people who don't know this, <laughs> you just got a great movie tip, The Lunchbox. Uh, but it really is about these Tiffins, which are a very cool way of carrying food. You got to be thinking about that for this food delivery stuff in COVID. Why don't we have a standard for this in the United States where when I get my Uber Eats or Postmates or DoorDash dropped off, you, dr you pick up the next time the stuff. I leave it on my front porch. That's what they do in Korea. You were thinking we, we think we were already working on some solutions for that. Mm, yum, yum. I love it. Uh, all right, listen, this has been amazing. Uh, if you want to save the world, get rid of bad jobs and help the environment, you know what to do. Go ahead and apply at dishcraft.com. You've been a great guest, Linda. Thanks for coming on the pod and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.